Hey, good morning. Good to see everyone. Uh, we're going to need all the time that we have today. I got story after story after story for you. Praise the Lord. A lot of it comes out of the Bible. Amen? <laughs> Amen. All right. I am going to begin uh, with a story to tie in to the fact that 2024 is the year of opportunity. Right. So, so I want to share something that I feel like God forced on me to explain the year of opportunity, and I would love to force it upon you. Now, the way that it works is we're going to go back to uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, the story begins at a comic store. Amen. I believe that all great stories begin at a comic store. And so I was nerding out at a comic store, and God had some ministry for me to do. I was there for one reason, I got to connect with uh, somebody that I really become friends with there, and just trying to share the love of Christ. So I had worked all day, that was towards the evening, I was ministering to them, and then I was like, okay, I gotta go home. I get in my car, and I live out in Folsom. I get in my car, and the light, uh, the gas light is on. Now, now, what the gas light is for, in case you guys aren't one, uh, are wondering, <laughs> is that I have a car that says you have 235 miles left or you have 170 miles left. And at some point, the light comes on, it blanks out and it's like, you may die at any time. <laughs> That's the light, you know what I'm saying? So I had the light on and I was like, ah, must get gas. So there's a main drag called East Bidwell, it goes through uh, kind of old Folsom. So I'm, I'm heading out and I'm driving down and there is a gas station that like used to be a Valero or something and then suddenly it just took all the signs down. So I don't know if it's a drug house, I don't know what it is, but anyway, they have really cheap gas, praise the Lord, okay? <laughs> Hopefully they're supplementing another way. Now, I was driving in, there's two lanes going one way, there's two lanes going the other way, I am in the far right lane when I suddenly have the compulsion that I must get gas at that gas station. However, I am now passing said gas station, so I make an extraordinary <laughs> illegal move. I then look around me and I'm like, there's nobody here. It's just Lance, you're the king of the world. So I decide to pull my, like at the last second, I pulled and went across four lanes of traffic, boom, pulled right into that Valero drug house. Anyway, <laughs> and so I, I go to get gas, and I never get gas here, but I was, I was getting gas, and I noticed, you know, you're <laughs> pumping gas and stuff moves in your periphery, and you're like, okay, I don't know what's going on over there, but... I now am so curious, I have to find out. So, so I look up and there's an older lady and she is moving across the parking lot and she is pushing a little cart. Now the cart has a ton of stuff, uh, too much stuff on it, and she is moving at an extraordinary slow pace. So she is moving like this. Well, when you see something moving that slow, you're like, what is going on over there? So I look over at her, and she looks at me at the exact same time. You know, it's one of those, you hope you can just spy on somebody, and then they look at you, and you're like, ah! Like, <laughs> don't look at me. So we locked eyes, and I just smiled. I'm like, hey, I'm gas pumping guy. How you doing, right? So I, I smile at her. Now, she is, she is uh, dressed in an interesting way. Uh, she's got the short shorts, halter top. She's got heels on that are, and it's like uh, clear gel heels, it's really high. And I was like, all right, so I, I think that she is either uh, living in the hotel across the street, which I believe is where she lives, or she's on the street, one of the two, that you can tell the whole dynamic is probably not very healthy. So she's moving, well, she's going down towards the street, and She's going, you know, uh, the streets are kind of curved, so the runoff of the water goes down the little drains. Does that make sense? So, well, there's a dip there, because it goes down from the gas station up onto the road. As she is getting to the dip, it starts to slide out from under her, right? Because you can tell this is not just her cart, it's kind of her walker, if that makes any sense. So she starts, and I hear, ah, 
from the, the right side. I spin around and I'm like, oh no, she's gonna go down. So I sprint away and I run over to her and I said, hey, and I grabbed her car and said, hey, you doing all right? She's like, oh, thank you for coming. I said, hey, where are we going today? She's like, I gotta get across the street. I live over there. And I was like, hmm, now that's four lanes of traffic and you're moving at the speed of drying paint. I can't get you to the crosswalk, that's even further. So uh, I said, hey, how about this? How about, would you allow me to escort you across the street? And she said, oh, that would be wonderful. And she kissed my hand. And, and she said, what is your name? I said, my name is Lance. She said, oh, hello, Lance. I said, what is your name? She said, my name's Deborah, like the Bible in the book of Judges. And I was like, I was like, oh, snap. You're a pastor, all right. So, so we start to move. Now, this was a bit of a civil engineering problem because she needed to hang on to the cart, but I also needed to push the cart up a little hill there. So we were doing our little dance and I was trying to move it up. And I realized we have about 20 minutes to chat to get across the road. You understand what I Like we have some significant time together. So I started dialogue with her, and she said, hey, I just turned 74. And I said, now I, I'm gonna suggest to you that life has been pretty rough, and so she seems quite a bit older than 74. We're gonna say that. So she said, I just turned 74. I said, happy birthday, Deborah. That's, that's awesome. And we're going across the street, and she said, two of my boys have committed suicide and I am really having a hard time getting past it. So clearly our relationship has now deepened <laughs> as we cross the first lane. And, and I'm, I'm thinking through, because immediately as a parent, right, I'm like, man, this is heavy. She's like, they were in a different state, I didn't have any access to them at the time, uh, I just don't know how to get through it. And I was like, huh, she goes, yeah, I, I'm also just healing up from a broken hip. So now all of a sudden I'm going, oh, if you put this all together, you understand why we are moving so slow, that you now have rough life, you have a broken hip, and you're 74, and, so, and you're wearing heels. So I'm like, okay, this all makes way more sense now. So as we're going across, she said, you are so nice, what is your name? And I said, my name is Lance. I'm like, what? you know what those pokey things that the knights use to knock people off horses? It's one of those, right? That's my name. And she's like, you are so, I love you, Lance. And I said, well, thank you, Deborah. And she kissed my hand again. And we continued going across the street. <clears throat> so we finally get to the other side and we had stopped traffic, needless to say. They were waiting for us. So we get to the other side and we get up on the even, the flat part. I said, hey, you gonna be okay from here? She said, yeah. And I said, do you mind if I pray for you, Deborah? She threw up her hand, she goes, let's go. <laughs> and I was like, mm-hmm. So I lay my hands on her and I'm just praying blessing over her and healing over her and everything else. And she said, that was wonderful. She, and I said, and she goes, what's your name? <laughs> and I said, I said, my name is Lancelot. I rescue people named Deborah. <laughs> and she's like, I love you, Lance. And I said, thank you, Deborah. I love you as well. And, and so she's about to go away. I said, you know, Deborah, I just got to let you know something. I never get gas here. I kid you not, I was driving down the road and I made the most radical turn to get in here, which by the way, I was prepared with a speech for the officer <laughs> that was going to pull me over. I was going to let him know that that was a move of the Holy Spirit <laughs> and that he will be paying my fees. Anyway, he wasn't there. So we continue with Deborah. So I said, Deborah, I just need you to know that God has his eyes on you, that I'm a pastor. She said, you're a what? I said, I'm a pastor. She said, that's wonderful. And she kissed my hand again. <laughs> There's a lot of kissing. 
And she, and I said, I'll just tell you, Deborah, obviously you're pretty important. I said, God literally moved me to be here at this time. And it was just to get you across the street. And I just need you to know, God is willing to move other people around just to care for you. And I just need you to know you're seen. She said, that is really sweet. She said, thank you very much. I said, all right, you have a good day. And I ran back, finished up my gas. Now, the reason why I bring up that story is to me, that's the year of opportunity. Did it change her life? No. But did she feel seen by God? Yes. Um, it, in a lot of my life, I don't have a lot of margin. I happen to have a piece of margin there, and God utilized it. And he's like, hey, dude, I need you to care for my daughter named Deborah. Right? That's all it was. But this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about anything fancy. I'm not talking about anything dramatic. I'm talking about helping Deborah's across a road. I'm talking about praying over somebody on the street uh, because you don't know what they're walking through. You don't know the pain in their heart. And maybe just for a moment, there was a slight uptick in joy because somebody was caring for them, right? I think this is the year of opportunity. You guys, let's dive into God's word, amen? All right, so take out your Bible and the handout sheet that was given to you at the front door. We can begin. It's part 15, walking through the gospel of Mark, and it's the greatest opportunity series. And I want to begin with a statement. If you're a note taker, you might want to write this down. Christians are never alone. Is that correct? Christians are never alone. When you submit your life to Christ and invite him into your heart, he is with you, the Bible says, perpetually. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, a Christian is never alone. And if the presence of God is with you, that means Jesus can change anything, which means for a Christian, your reality is always adjustable. Whatever is currently going on, God can alter. If you believe in prayer, you actually believe in this concept to some degree. What God can do is alter reality on behalf of his children. It's actually why we pray, yeah? Because we connect one with him and say, God, can you help me here? And he said, well, I need to move a few pieces around. Does that make sense? All right. Now, are we all clear that the second person of the Trinity, who we now know as Jesus Christ, did not start at the manger? Are we all clear on that? He's pretty active in the Old Testament, meaning he is the visible part of God. He is the tangible part of God in many ways. Now, I'm gonna suggest to you that he's been changing scenarios since the dawn of mankind. I'll give you an example. Noah was going to drown until Jesus gave him a boat plan. Is that correct? All right. Joseph would have died in jail if Jesus didn't let him out, but he did. The Hebrew people would die at the foot of the Red Sea until Jesus opened it up. The Jewish nation would have died of thirst in the wilderness unless Jesus brought water out of a rock David would have fell to Goliath if Jesus didn't train him and direct the rock. Lazarus would have stayed in the tomb if what? Jesus didn't call him out. There you go. Naaman would have remained a leper if Jesus didn't clean him in the river. The Hebrew boys would have been burned and eaten if Jesus didn't walk in the fire and sit in the den. And we would all die in our sins if Jesus didn't go to the cross, but he did. The fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you is this. Jesus brings opportunity wherever he goes. Amen? Jesus brings opportunity wherever he goes. You see, as long as he's there, you got the X factor, you got the Jesus factor. As long as Jesus is there, everything's bendable. 
everything's adjustable. There is no such thing as that's just the way it is. That's not a thing. Because if Jesus thinks differently, then it will change things. Turn with me to Mark chapter six. Mark chapter six, verse 30. If you need a Bible, there's one under the seat in front of you. It's gonna be page 841, 841. If you were with us last week, I was talking about John the Baptist getting his head cut off. Anybody remember that story? It's a good one for kids. All right. I talked about the fact that there were four Herods in the New Testament. You guys remember that? There's baby Jesus Herod, there's adult Jesus Herod, there is Peter Herod, and there is Paul Herod. All right, so they're all called Herod, but there's four different ones. And then I closed out by talking about the fact that Jesus had sent out his apostles on their first mission. It was a field trip. They had to go into a brutal situation, do hardcore ministry, cast out demons, heal the sick, tell people God is here. And they had to do it all in teams of two, but without Jesus, they were on their own. They were now going to come back and debrief that experience. That's where we begin our story today. Cool? All right, Mark chapter six, verse 30, it says this. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And Jesus said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many people were coming and going and they didn't have a break even to eat. And they went away in the boat to the other side of the lake to a desolate place by themselves. All right, let's pause. Resting is necessary for healthy ministry. Is that true? Yes. You go, well, it's good I'm not in ministry. I correct. Yeah. If you're a Christian, you're in ministry. So it doesn't matter whether you have a title or not, everybody's in ministry. So rest is necessary for you to do healthy ministry. How many of us have revealed the worst version of ourselves because we were exhausted, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like we lash out at people, we snap at people. All right, what that's doing is obscuring the image of Jesus. Okay? Jesus didn't want to snap at them. He didn't want to lash out at them. So when you do that, it takes people out of the picture of talking with Jesus. But you're the only Jesus they may see, right? So we all have a mandate to be as healthy as we possibly can so Jesus can use us whenever he wants. He doesn't have to wait for us to have a good day. He can just say, hey, kiddo, we're on. Go love on somebody. So our job is to make sure we heal up from things. Our job is to make sure we're getting proper self-care, which for some of us, that is tough. We are not paying attention to the fact that our diet matters, that our sleep matters, and that our emotional health matters. You've got to take care of yourself or we're not gonna be useful for ministry. It's not selfish, it's good stewardship, amen? All right, now, it says he wanted his guys to go away from everybody else. And you go, hmm, I thought you guys were in ministry. Richard Foster said this, we must go away from people so that we can be truly present when we are with people. He's talking about the discipline of silence and solitude. We must step away from the crowd to recenter and align with God so we can re-engage in a healthy way. If we are always in the busy, always in the chaos, we will be too attached to the chaos and not as attached to the Lord. That's the principle. Now, we move forward, verse 33. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. John's gospel adds, because they saw the signs that he was doing to the sick. Let's pause for a moment. Before, Jesus was the famous dude. 
Now they all went out and healed, cast demons. Now you got 13 famous dudes. So everyone can go, listen, I thought I had to get to Jesus. I only got to get to you. So now everybody's a big deal. So when they began to go away, everybody was tracking, I need a miracle from those guys. So they run around the lake to go head them off. Remember, they're exhausted and they're just trying to get a break, okay? Verse 34, when they went ashore, they saw a great crowd and Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now we can say, Mark, that's really poetic that you wrote that. That's pretty cool imagery. Nope, it's prophetic tie-in to the Old Testament. Here's why. What Mark is trying to demonstrate is Jesus is the new Moses. Why is that important? Because Moses was the primary leader from God to set up the nation of Israel. It was also his role to lead them into the covenant, which is the Mosaic law, the Levitical law. He was the one that demonstrated provision, protection, and miracles. Is that correct? Every Jew looked back to Moses. He was our leader. Now, this is a reference by Mark to tie into two books of the Bible. There is a reference in the book of Numbers, and it says Moses knew that he wasn't going to be around forever. So he said, may the Lord raise up another leader after me so the people won't be like sheep without a shepherd. Now, it's interesting. Anybody remember the name of the guy who took over for Moses? Joshua, or we would say Yeshua, or we would say in modern, Jesus. Interesting that the guy who took over for Moses, his name was really Jesus, and you go, huh, I wonder if that's a coincidence. Probably not. The second reference is that in Ezekiel 34, the prophet was talking about it and he was saying, may the Lord himself step in as the shepherd for Israel because their leadership is so poor. May God be the one so that they are not sheep without a shepherd. So what we have is we have a prophecy of a future, not just Joshua, a future prophet like Moses that was gonna show up, lead Israel, and he would be God himself. These are all prophecies that zero in right here. Make sense? All right. It says, and John helps us out a little bit. Luke helps us out a little bit. John tells us, Jesus went up on a mountain and he sat down with his disciples and welcomed the people, Mark says, and he began to teach them many things, and Luke explains, and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured all those who had need of healing. So, we have a preaching time where Jesus sits on a hill. The reason why you sit up on a hill is everyone can see you, everyone can hear you. It's just a practical logistical thing, right? You think about the Sermon on the Mount, same way. Jesus gathered everybody, but then he did a healing service. Remember, what was drawing the crowds was the miracle ministry, not the talking ministry. The talking ministry was helping change their hearts but the miracle ministry was getting their attention. All right, now it says this, verse 35, and when it grew late, ah, shoot, they were looking for a break, yes. and they got caught immediately, and they've been doing it all day long. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, the hour is late. Send the people away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages so they can get themselves something to eat. Which I think is really sweet, yeah? I mean, they're thinking, again, practical. Hey, Jesus, it's getting super late. All these people came here on foot. They've been with us all day long. I don't think they were expecting that. Can we just cut it so they can go get a bite to eat? 
I think that's very kind. But Jesus had something else in store. Jesus answered, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Well, that's gonna be a bit of a problem because there's a whole bunch of them, right? John adds this, Jesus said to Philip, where can we buy some bread so that everybody can eat? But notice this line, quote, Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was about to do. Hmm. And they said, what are we gonna go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? It wouldn't be enough for a little bit for everybody. That amount of money is a year's wages for a laborer. They're like, dude, we don't have that cash on us. Now, question, why did Jesus ask them about the logistics of buying food? Jesus knew he was gonna do a miracle. Did Jesus really not know the scenario? No, he knew the scenario. Then why ask the question? Because he was getting them to think through the scenario, right? Let's make it personal. Why do you have the problems you have? If I was to say, name your top five challenges right now. How do you know those? You're like, uh, dude, it's pretty obvious. I would disagree. I would suggest to you that you have many problems going on in your life that you are not aware of right now. Is that not true? Stuff that's gonna come around the corner, stuff that's in play right now, the only reason why you know the problems you have is because God told you the problems you have, right? Why would he highlight a problem? Because he highlights a gap between your ability and your problem, for what reason? So that when he fills that gap, you attach it to him for relationship. In other words, he wants you to know what's wrong so when he makes it right, there's a connection. You see, God is constantly doing stuff for us. You don't have any idea. The fact that you didn't get in a crash yesterday is not because of your awesome driving. I don't know if you've heard this, but there's a guy out there that cuts across four lanes <laughs> of traffic, and he is driving our streets. I don't know if he knew that. Okay, the reason you didn't maybe get in a crash yesterday is because God protected you, but you didn't give him any glory for the non-crash. You only gave him glory for that which you saw was a problem that he solved, all right? So he's highlighting the problem, he's about to fill it so they can connect with them. But what's so interesting is the phrase, they don't need to go away, you need to fix it. They obviously looked out and said, yeah, that's not a thing I can do. And I'm wondering whether or not we as Christians who are called to be the salt and light of the world, who are called to be ambassadors for heaven, I'm afraid that when we see a need, we think about what's in our pocket and if we don't got it, we move on. You are a child of God. That means you have access to things people don't have access to. If you don't have the answer in your pocket, you might need to pray it down from heaven. Y'all tracking with me? So if somebody is in need, you might need to become an intercessor so that their need might be met. That is our job. So. Jesus sets up this whole thing, there's a problem, guys, we need to fix it. So I'm gonna ask a practical question that I think some of you wanna know. So when are we supposed to do good planning and when are we supposed to look for a miracle? Anybody ever think about this question? Because sometimes Jesus is like, hey, just do the stuff, and other times he's like, we're doing a miracle. You're like, I don't know what you want me to do here. Like, are we going right or left? I'm gonna give you three principles on how to sort that out. If you're a note taker, write these down. Number one, ask, th ask yourself three questions. Number one, did God provide the means already? If he gave you the means already, you might just need to use them to advance the ball, okay? But remember, a miracle ahead of time is still a miracle. Provision in advance isn't less beautiful than provision at the last minute. We must use wisely what we've been given. 
A lot of times God gave it to you, you just mismanaged it and now you can't use it anymore. Mm -mm. That doesn't mean he didn't give it to you. It just means you didn't use it wisely, right? But if he gave it to you and you got it and you can solve the problem, solve the problem. Great, let's be practical. Number two, did you check in with God? Did you check in with God? Just because you have the provision doesn't mean you ignore the provider. Well, God already gave me a ton of money, so I don't need to talk to him. What the heck are you talking about? No, 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 you got it, but remember, you got it, and you still have a relationship with God, and it's honoring that before you use his provisions, you check in with him and go, hey, Lord, is it cool if I use this? Because he may randomly go, eh, probably not this time, right? He might say, hey, 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 notice that there is actually, I need you to use that, but I need to use this later. I'm changing the scenario on you. So we're gonna ask question number three. You ready? Is there a faith gap? A faith gap. Is there an area where God may want to do more than what's in your pocket? Do you have a stirring in your spirit that he wants to do something different? Are there indicators that your practical nature is taking over when you should be thinking through a supernatural lens? I think in any given scenario, let's say you had $5 in your pocket and you needed to go get $5 worth of food. But then God said, you know what? I'm glad you checked in with me. I need you to bring your buddy and get him food. You're like, I only have five bucks. He's like, then I guess you need another five bucks then, huh? You're like, well, where am I gonna get that? And he's like, well, that's funny. I happen to have five bucks. That's when you shift from practical to supernatural. And then you start praying for a miracle. Make sense? All right, nobody thinks so. Okay, <laughs> let's go ahead. Now we're about to walk into one of the most famous stories of all time. It is taught in all four Gospels, so I'm going to take them all, shove them together, and read as if all four were talking, all right? Here's how it goes. And Jesus said to them, how many loaves of bread do you have? Go and see. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, well, there's a boy right here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Pause, I wonder if the kid was in on the plan. The kid's like, I'm sorry, what are you, what, are you looking at my lunch? What the heck, bro? I didn't say you could eat it. My, my mom packed that for me. And Jesus said, great, bring him here to me. For there were about 5,000 men. And he ordered his disciples to command them to sit down in groups. Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and they sat in groups by hundreds and fifties on the green grass. And there was much green grass in the place. Let's pause, does that matter? It only does because Mark is trying to tie to the Old Testament and the way ancient Israel moved through the wilderness was they would camp in groups of 50 and 100. So this is a hearkening back to ancient Israel. Jesus is leading new Israel. Does that make sense? And taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. When he had given thanks, he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples set them before the crowds. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they had as much as they wanted. They all ate and were satisfied, and he told his disciples, gather up the leftovers that nothing may be lost. And what was left over was picked up, 12 personal size wicker baskets full, of broken pieces and the fish left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men plus women and children. That's 7,500 people, at least. What's so interesting about that is the two biggest towns in the area only had 2,500 people in them each. That means you not only have the entire population of the two largest towns, you have another 2,500 people that came from somewhere else. This is a massive group of people. A couple things we need to highlight through. He said, how many loaves do we have? That's a teaching moment. Then he said, bring them to me. What the heck is a Happy Meal gonna do when you gotta serve 7,500 people? 
right? Because we're talking about baby loaves. This is a kid's lunch. This is baby loaves and two small dried salted fish. That's all it is. How are we gonna do that? How are we going to divide all that up? It's pretty regular, and that's the truth. That which is not enough becomes more than enough. Because normal things in the hands of God become extraordinary. How do we know that? Anybody remember the story of Moses? Moses was out in the desert by himself and there was a burning bush and he heard a voice. Moses, because Mo God has a very deep voice. <laughs> Moses. And he goes over and, and God starts talking to him and he's like, you need to be my deliverer. And he's like, they're never gonna listen to me. He's like, then you better do a miracle. And he's like, with what? He's like, I don't know, what do you got? He's like, I have a stick. Because he had his little staff, that was it. He didn't have anything. He's like, I got my staff and my Pokemon cards. But I don't think those are going to be useful. So anyway, he has his staff. And his staff, God's like, all right, cool, we'll use that. And he's like, what am I going to do with a stick? He's like, I don't know, throw it down. Throws it down, it becomes a snake. He's like, whoa, I didn't know sticks could do that. And God said, they don't normally. So he grabs it and it becomes a staff again. And he's like, well, that was cool. In the hands of God, the ordinary becomes extraordinary, yes? A regular welcome mat became confirmation to Gideon the warrior. A jawbone of a donkey became a weapon of mass destruction in the hands of Samson. Oil and flour became a miraculous overflow supply. In the, in the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. What does that have to do with us? If you are an ordinary person, you're perfect. That's just what Jesus was looking for. Because an ordinary person in the hands of God becomes an extraordinary person. I mean, you just gotta understand, God didn't need to choose you because you were brilliant. God just needed you to be available. If you go, God, I don't know what you could do with me, he said, you know what, I do a lot with a little. So if you maybe struggle with going, I don't feel like I'm much of anything, boy, you're beautifully perfect because God can use you right where you're at to change the world. That's just what he does, amen? It says, Jesus prayed this prayer and started to break the pieces apart. What magic words do you think he used? Right? Was a bibbity bobbity boo in there? An abracadabra, maybe? Because he's about to do an extraordinary miracle, and you know you have to have the magic formula words, right? Isn't that what we think? I gotta pray for something. Oh my gosh, I hope I say it right. What do you mean, say it right? What's the right way to say it? Here's what I think it sounded like, because the language in the text suggests it was a prayer just like every Jew did over every meal. Pretty basic, pretty straightforward. What was it? I think it went something like this. Father, we have a need. Thank you for providing anything at all. May you bless what we have to be more than enough. Amen. Nothing fancy. And then he started breaking it. When they got done, they gathered up more than they started with. Shouldn't that have been a pretty clear indicator of a miracle? Right? Because you got to assume the disciples keep coming back. And they're like, all right, we got more. Okay, that's great. And we're going back. Notice the chain of command. What's the chain of command? Did Jesus give anybody their meal? Nope. Who did he give it to? Disciples. Disciples gave it to the people. What is God's chain of command? He's the miracle worker. You're the middleman. Get it to the people who have need. That's how it works. Did the disciples multiply the loaves and fishes? They did not. They just distributed it. You guys, you're never going to heal anybody, but you're the distributor. You're the one that's gonna pray and lay hands on people and God's gonna go right through you as a conduit 
If you said, man, I can't imagine I could heal anybody, well, I would agree with you. You cannot. <laughs> but God can, and therefore, he just wants you to be the middleman. You just got to distribute the glory of God. That's what we do around here. God could go direct. He just doesn't want to. He would like to use you. It says, immediately he made his disciples, we're in verse 45, get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Remember, another long day. While he dismissed the crowd and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Now, Mark does not do that story justice. He's kind of the shortened version. If you read John, you find out that was a pretty dramatic scene. Why? Because what John adds is as soon as the disciples were gone, the people had seen the miracle Jesus did and they grabbed him physically and forcefully and tried to force him to become their king. That's awkward. Eventually, he got out of it. Isn't it weird that people always want to make Jesus what they want him to be? and not just accept him for who he is. You see, they wanted a political leader. He refused to be that for them. They eventually let him die for that. What do you want him to be? Because you keep messing with him too. In your head, you keep making Jesus somebody that's your butler or your aspirin. So when does Jesus get to be Jesus and you gotta morph around him? When do you get to read the Bible and say, I need to change my life to match that, not make that match my life? Y'all tracking with me? Because we all do it. I do the exact same thing. The version I tell you of Jesus is going to be biased because it's going through my mind. That's why we all need to read the word for ourselves and allow God to remake himself in his own image and not just have it bent by a person. Make sense? All right, here we go. It says, he went up on the mountain to pray by himself. Um... That's how it should be. Do any of you do this? You're like super freaked out and you're, you're, you're super heavy from the day and you can just withdraw and pray, chill out, re-rack and get filled back up. Does anybody do that? Okay, I'm, I'm pretty jealous of you guys because I actually don't do that. That's how it should be. And I, my personality struggles with that. Um, and I'm not mature enough yet that uh, I can't seem to shut my brain off. I, you know, I have a lot of different issues with this. And so I think how it's supposed to go is that prayer is a place of refreshment. I tend to look at it as a place of warfare, a place of intercession, a place of ministry. I see it as an activity. And when I'm super tired, I don't want to do more activity. And so I don't use prayer for that reason. And that's unfortunate because that's where God just wants to minister to me. So hopefully you guys are a little further than I am on that one. It says this. In verse 47, we're gonna read another incredibly famous story, but Mark's version is lame. So we're going to grab all the gospels and put them together. Luke doesn't even tell this story at all. John and Matthew do, but then some of them leave parts out, so we're just gonna go ahead and shove the whole thing together. Here's what it sounds like. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got in a boat, started across. Jesus, after he dismissed the crowds, went up on a mountain to pray. When evening came, he was there alone on the land, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land on the sea, beaten by the waves. The sea had become rough because of a strong wind blowing. They had rowed about three to four miles out, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And in the fourth watch of the night, at 3 a.m., he came to them walking on the water. Coming near the boat, he was passing by when all the disciples saw him walking on the water, and they were terrified. They cried out in fear, it's a ghost. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come on out. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, 
came to Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, and said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind calmed down. Those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately, the boat was at the land where they were going. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. Hmm. Famous story, yeah? He was walking on water. Two people walked on water, is that correct? Yeah. So we give Peter a hard time. We're like, you didn't get very far. Okay. Yeah, nobody else got out, right? Give the dude some credit. Like this guy. And you kind of go, why? Right? Peter's like, if you're doing it, I'm doing it. I want to go out there too. So Jesus is like, come on out. Right? And so he gets out and he's like, do, do, do. Which, by the way, I have a logistical problem. I don't know how to walk on water. When it's a storm, now if it's calm, totally get it. If it's stormy, do you go up on the wave and then down on the wave and then up on the wave and down on the wave, up on the wave and down on the wave. And if the wave is moving, that's very trip hazards. You know what I'm saying? And then, or do you just walk through and get your dress wet and just just push through the wave? Keep going, right? I don't understand how to do it. But anyway, there's a learning curve to this. Peter starts doing that. Then all of a sudden, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm walking on water. I'm not supposed to be able to do this. And blink. He's like, ah! And Jesus is like, I got you. Pulls him back up, right? Now, Jesus rebukes him, right? Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And you kind of go, well, that's mean. He's never done this before. He's new. The other thing that's funny is they're four miles out. Jesus had been for four miles as he got out there. You know, it's a really long way. And and I guess what I'm I'm wondering is why Jesus rebuked him. And then it dawns on me. Here's what I think he was saying. Hey, kiddo, you do realize you were walking on water, right? Yeah, I know, that's what was freaking me out. No, no, no. You were walking on water. Why'd you take your eyes off me? You see, if you were looking at me, you were doing the impossible. Somehow, you allowed your circumstances to be more true than my word. Why'd you do that? Why did you give more credence to the physical than to the supernatural? Am I not here? Have I not taught you that? Dude, you walked on water. And yet somehow you still got talked out of it by your circumstance. How do we live, yes? Oh my gosh, I have a cancer diagnosis. It's the end of me. Hold on. Not unless Jesus says so, right? What I'm trying to tell you is that if Jesus can make water a solid, or a human body light enough to walk on water, then I'm pretty sure he can adjust your situation. Yeah? The only question is whether or not it's in his plan. That's all. Hmm. Jesus is Lord of circumstance, is he not? How in the world do they not understand about the loaves? They're the ones that started with the Happy Meal and got 12 baskets left over. Shouldn't they have been like, oh my gosh, what a killer miracle. And even if they understood it was a miracle, clearly there was some gap, because now they're like, oh my gosh, you're the son of God. He's like, yeah, I've been the son of God the whole time. Like, how come you guys are so slow, right? Go to verse 53. When they crossed over, they came to the land and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized them ran about the whole region, began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever he was. And wherever he went, villages, cities, countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Hmm. 
It sounds like they didn't get another break, right? What were they doing all night? <sighs> oh, right, they're just rowing. They can't even get, I mean, it's just all night long. When all of a sudden Jesus shows up, boom, they're at land. Now all of a sudden everybody's like, hey, you're here. I need something from you. And they're just drained. Not a great pace, right? Crowds followed him everywhere. What would you do if your baby could be healed and you knew the person who could do it? What are you willing to do? Anything. That's these people. It's possible the reason why we don't see as many miracles today is because we have so many other solutions, right? Maybe. I still think we need miracles so people can see heaven. So I'm gonna still push supernatural ministry in this church. But... Why do they think that if they touch his clothes, they can get healed? It's kind of weird. Oh, that's right, because a woman touched his clothes and got healed. And they were like, oh, I gotta do that. And they all wanted to touch him because they knew that power was coming out of him. Seems to me they were pretty convinced that he could do anything. Sounds like their faith was pretty high. What about you? Here's how we're gonna close. We're gonna pray for a miracle. In a moment, we're gonna pray and I'm gonna have you stand up if you need a touch from God. But I would like you to think through what your problem really is. I'm not so sure the problem you're thinking of is your problem. I think there's an underlying problem that's causing that problem. And that if God gave you what you needed right now, you may not have the support system to handle it. We might fall back into the same problem. So I'd like you to just think for a moment, what is your true root problem? Because that might be what he wants to heal today.